Hey everyone, super excited for, for another episode here. I've got Noam Kaiser here on the show, venture capitalist. He does a lot of uh, angel investments. Uh, Noam, thank you for being on the show. A pleasure. So l- let the audience, uh, t- tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Um, I'll try and tell a lot very quickly. Uh, <laughs> I'm a venture capitalist for the best, past 16 years. Uh, started off at 2008, which was a great year to start with VC, <laughs> uh, with Offer High Tech, which was a seed stage investor, uh, caught the entrepreneurial bug, started my own startup, cloud-based uh, solution for actually for VCs and investors in 2011, then 2014, sorry, 13, became a member of Gemini Israel uh, Ventures, which was one of really the best uh, early stage investors in Israel. Um, after the fund finished its activity, I was the head of the uh, Amazon Web Services venture capital team uh, in Israel. Then uh, joined Intel Capital as a partner, and I was there for about five years. Uh, recently left to start a new venture, time will tell. Uh, but current days, as things are going on right now in Israel, I'm the head of the investment committee for the IRF, the Israel Resilience Fund. It's a fund that helps out uh, companies that are doing well, but have caught some sort of distress during this period. And we've already made uh, 37 investments in the past mm. five months. Amazing. So how, how different it is, you know, so you've got, you've got what I call the diversified, the, the ver- diversified VC. What do I mean by that is that yeah. you've, you have experience in being in, you know, a very traditional kind of like VC fund. And then also being on like the investment string of like a company like Amazon or Intel, what what are what is the difference between the two in terms of the the day to day work? How you validate? How you make uh, investments? Great, great question. I, I, by the way, it wasn't by chance. It was sort of directed because as I was moving along in the VC industry, I realized that since every startup, be it Israeli, be it American, aims to work with corporate America, uh, sell to quarter, uh, corporate America, and eventually be acquired most likely by Mm -hmm. corporate America in most cases, uh, I decided that I need some corporate background just to simply better understand the ecosystem I'm working in. So um, I I guess in 30,000 feet view, the main differences that you'll have with a uh, strategic VC compared with a financial VC is that if a strategic VC needs to be, of course, aligned with the uh, uh, focus activity of the startup as far as How does it contribute the strategic investors company and its business unit? Uh, But also, and I think more importantly, and it was definitely the case with Intel, uh, is there anything other than money that the strategic investor can deliver to the company? Usually when you don't see any added value that you can contribute, there's not much point in making the investment, even if there's a sort of focal alignment. Um, So that would be the first case. Uh, yes, usually the processes are a bit lengthier because there is some corporate yellow tape that you need to cut through. Um, but I got to say, as we are moving to the fourth decade of strategic investments in venture capital, it has become more, uh, I would say, friendly towards other investors. You see strategic investing alongside financials. You see them investing with each other even competitor investment investors like Nvidia and Intel will co-invest in a company if it serves it. Um, and really, I think as far as the startups are concerned, the best way to determine whether you want to take an investment from a corporate VC, you need to do the same thing you would do with a financial VC. Talk to the CEOs of portfolio companies that have already taken investments from them and learn about how the experience was. Mm-hmm. So, by the way, just just yeah. one thing that is a commonality, in the longitude of time, both a financial VC and a corporate VC are interested in revenue. Uh, corporate VCs that are solely strategic, that don't uh, get measured over uh, revenue, don't survive in mm-hmm. within the corporate. They have to also deliver the goods, as far as I'm aware. Would you say a corporate VC is more patient? than a more traditional financial VC in terms of allocating more time and more thought for each individual startup? 
I would say that they are as far as the due diligence process. You would usually encounter more thorough due diligence. Um, and in many cases, if they are allowed to do so, and if they led the round, they will also allocate a director or an observer to the company. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, they, and again, you should measure with each one before taking the money from them, but some of them, and I guess I, I will give Intel Capital high credit on that. Uh, there is a very serious effort in generating added value and even uh, specialized teams within the venture firm that only do that. They're not investors. They're separate teams, usually uh, business development or sales teams from that corporate, which is di diverted to the fund. And now we're focusing to generating revenue and cooperations uh, with the startup, with the portfolio companies. Usually they'll be able to provide more added value than a non-strategic uh, mm -hmm. VC. So, you know, VC, I'm sure you know this, and it won't come as a surprise as I say these words, but there is a controversial opinion about VC added value among entrepreneurs, oh, yes. right? Many entrepreneurs um, think... And I don't I say many, I don't actually have the statistics to back this up, right? But it's just like a feeling that you know that VCs like to talk about value adding. They even have people yeah. they even have people on on payroll that are called like um uh business value admin or whatever. Um uh and I'm gonna, I'm gonna piss off a lot of people when I answer. <laughs> so you know, and so yeah, you know, you you see where I'm going with this. Um, my answer is this: Do you think? I'm sure there's many VCs who have real value, tangible value, but do you think the majority of venture capital firms and individual venture capitalists are adding value to the business itself outside the the initial investment? So two parts. All of them will say they do. <laughs> and if there's one thing you'll see on every every VC website. They like to provide added value, and they're not even in it for the money. They're there to empower founders. <laughs> well, no, they're there to make money, and they are committed, and they should be committed to the LPs, the limited partners that invested in the fund, and generate ROI. But you only do that when both sides win. So I would say probably the majority of VCs this day and age, because we are just after a wave of new VCs that have sprung like uh, mushrooms after the rain, uh, <laughs> most of them simply don't have enough experience or a network to provide any added value. And those are the two elements that, in, that differentiate between those that do provide added value and those that don't. Those that have the experience, simply for the sheer amount and volume of investments they've made, they've been exposed to so many incidents and events in the startup life, uh, the next round that they're going to get, an M&A process, replacing the CEO, and so and so, experience plays a long part in a, a big part uh, and goes a long way as far as if they contribute added value or not, and of course, their network. Uh, and what I really like to see as one of the best ways that VCs can uh, promote added value is uh, forums. It's CEO forums within the portfolio. Yes, you see a lot of uh, startup founders, especially the younger ones, which are a bit sarcastic and cynical about it. But as you gain experience, I saw that that is one of the most contributive things a VC can do. And anyone who's been a startup CEO, I can say that I have been, knows that it's the loneliest position there is on earth. Even if you're a team of founders, one of you becomes the CEO, he or she are going to be in the most lonely position there is. And it really helps to be part of a portfolio. And it's not just the CEOs. When you have a CMO forum, a CTO forum, CFO forum, these things help. And that by itself provides a lot of value because there's no one you trust more than a counterpart who is facing the, cha the same challenges, especially if he or she, I mentioned experience, I've already been through this rodeo once or twice before. I just see the difference in companies before and after they meet a more uh, veteran CEO and get to learn from them. So there you is added value, yeah. but uh, not from everyone. You co-invested with probably many 
VCs and even individual angel investors, etc. Yeah. Could you could you name some names that you think that actually brought in value to their companies, to their portfolios? Well, yeah, I mean, um, actually, one of them was my boss, uh, my former head at Intel Capital, Yael Shoham, two-time startup founder before becoming a VC, then one of the founders of Genesis, then Intel mm -hmm. Capital. Immense amount of experience. Uh, he's also now one of the most active angel investors in Israel and a great guy. So I saw him as someone that provided a lot of added value. Um, he does it in his own style, which is very uh, sort of compassionate, but still very, very forward. Uh, there are folks like uh, Ronan Mir, uh, which you probably know, formerly Viola, now PSG Equity. Uh, Ronan has a very methodological view of uh, uh, planning and the approach of how to manage a board meeting and how to manage your company. And he comes back by data and experience and other companies' experience, plus a 30,000 feet view of the segment that you're going to work with, giving you some sort of uh, perspective that is very helpful. So those are two that come to mind, which I was fortunate enough to sit on boards with. Um, you know, sort of caught me off guard, so I don't have a lot yeah. coming up. But um, I, I got to say, my work with the folks at Adresen Horowitz was also uh, really impressed me as far as what they're bringing to the table because of the vast experience, the vast network, and also the fact that they have specialized funds within the fund. And they always allocate to a certain board or to work with a certain company folks that really do know the corridors of relevant corporates and companies that can help out the CEO. So that's another one. Yes, a a a sixteen Z has built a machine uh, by now of actually oh, yeah. producing. It's it's a complete machine. So I've been talking to some people um, that have worked with them, etc. And it's it's on a completely different level of what in terms of what they're doing. This kind of leads me. This leads me to another question, and, it's, and it kind of connects to something you said. So you said, you know, in the end of the day, the VCs, they have to report to their LPs and to, to their, you know, financial institutions who are backing them, right? Yeah. And uh, during the bubble, uh, I, I, I would say probably, um, you know, I, there was a big tech bubble in 21, 22, um, yeah. and you we you've seen VCs coming out of nowhere, people who are able to oh raise God, money. Yeah people who are able to raise money from institu institutionals and pri and private you know high high net worth uh, LPs yeah. and I'll be honest with you and I'm not a politically correct person you know when I was welcome to the party <laughs> welcome to the party yeah so when I, when I was uh, talking to some of those people I, I was like telling my teammates after conversations with them with some of those VCs is like who would trust this people to make startup investment decisions right like what kind of experience they have and it's not and like why would an institutional you know uh, the person you know who's in charge of a, of, a, of a financial institution you know the person who's in charge of allocating the budgets why would he choose this people to allocate the budget so what i'm trying to ask you is um do you have an answer for that is that oh, simply, yeah. is that simply so a high answers. Yeah, go I ahead. I have so many answers to that. And, I, and again, let's just continue pissing everyone off. Uh, <laughs> when, in many cases, what I saw, I could sort of, you know, encapsulate it in, in this sentence. People who don't know what they're talking about, telling people who don't know what to do, what to do. <laughs> that has been too, late 2019 until the end of 2022. And you saw it in oh, so many sayings like, oh, the VC model is broken. The 10x on ARR is no longer relevant. Uh, unicorn is not the measure. Everyone is a unicorn. And so on and so on. Uh, basically, what happened is what always happens every decade. But I was there in 2008, and I was privileged to learn from those who were there in 2001 and then experienced 2022. And we'll all experience 2031, which <laughs> will be the next time this bullshit happens. <laughs> uh, what's happening is that money becomes a commodity. Money becomes a commodity. And folks are trying, this goes back to what we said about experience. People are trying to say, well, experience doesn't matter because those models are not relevant anymore. What matters is who's going to give you the best valuation? Who's going to give you more money for less equity? And that's how they win 
deals. And just to explain the cycle, it always begins in New York. Money becomes a commodity. We're inflated. There's a whole lot of money out there. Um, there was zero interest for about 15 years straight. So the institutionals and the real estate, no one created anything that was attractive for investors in New York. So the money goes from New York to the Valley. The promise is, okay, there's nothing happening on a lot of the financial markets and the real estate market. Let's give it to the VC and we'll see a great return in four, five, six, seven years. What happens in Silicon Valley transpires to what happens in Silicon Valley. We hmm. begin to imitate. We always imitate. We're not an island. We're completely impacted. And we start to do the same. Too many VCs with too much money leading to too high valuation and a valuation game as the, uh, as you know, is the, the only truth out there. And everyone plays along, not just the new VCs, but also the existing VCs, which are more experienced are saying, well, there's no other way to win. And they tell their CEOs, okay, even if you've already been VC backed, go get the money while you can get it and get it in a great valuation. That's how we appreciate as well. And very few say, we're not going to play this game. We're not going to play this game. We're not going to make an investment in 2021 if it's going to be stupid. And when I say stupid is we're going to create a situation where by default, our companies are going to have to go through a down round in two years. You're that giving them a valuation that they will never meet. It's insane. And everyone knew that it was going to happen. Everyone knew it was going to happen with the exception of the new kids on the block, which simply didn't have the experience to realize that they're messing it up for everyone. So this is where I keep telling folks, don't belitter and don't ignore experience because nothing that happened in 2020 to 2022 was new. This was exactly the same thing as before. And uh, this was it. Folks simply won through valuations and the sizes of checks. And subsequently, it messes up things, not just for the VCs, but for the companies themselves. They begin to hire people for too much money that they can't support for too long as far as salaries. They start making expensive expenses that make no sense. Like, okay, let's open up shop in Sao Paulo for some reason, because we might sell in South America and so on and so on. The lean startup is not a religion. I'm not saying that you should strangle yourself. And yes, when there's some money and some surplus and some income, let's increase salaries. Let's, you know, live a little more normal life because people sacrifice a lot to start. But there's never a time in the startup life when it makes sense to be wasteful and irresponsible. Hmm. And that was a story. That, Long that, that, answer to a short question. No, yeah. no, it's a, it's a very good answer for 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 that question. You know, I manage, I manage a portf two portfolios. I I manage a portfolio of public traded uh, stocks, yeah, and I manage a portfolio of privately private companies, yeah. And you know, I'm not a traditional VC, so when I look at investments, I look at it first first and foremost as you know. As, as you want to buy low and you want to sell high, right? Yeah. Because in the traditional markets, it's very easy to know. It's not that easy, but it's easier to know when a stock is in a discounted price and you can, and you can, can right. buy it in, in a big velocity and you have like a target price exit that you want to aim for. Correct, in, yeah. In, in the private sector, it's a bit more complicated than that um, because there's two things that are, that are a, a bit difficult to understand. One is private company valuations, when you value a private company and you value it compared to a, a, a similar company in the same niche, it doesn't mean the mar like there isn't enough people in the market who are participating who are deciding that this is a rational price, right? That's, right. The, that's the first thing. The second thing is you have what I what happened in, in, in 2021, um, maybe a bit in 22, is, the, is this whole secondary playbook where basically you have companies uh private companies who who you know they have you have the CEOs the leadership team and the VCs selling secondary shares through those companies while you know two year old companies three year old companies that people are selling second secondary shares and for 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 an outside investor they're thinking okay I, I I know this private company valuation doesn't make any sense but in this 
pyramid scheme of things, someone is going to come in and buy, buy this thing, right? So let me give you a sort of, I don't know if it's a ground rule, but here's a, like an indicator. Um, when a company is VC backed and it goes public, the VC investors are forbidden from cashing out immediately for good reason. Right. Uh, because they, there's a limit of six months and then another amount after 12 months and, and so on. It makes a lot of sense because if you've convinced us, stock market investors of all kinds of sort, that this is worth backing, you got to have some skin in the game. You don't take it off as soon as you put it in. The same applies for, or should apply for privately held companies. Yes, secondary is definitely a legitimate market, but it's not legitimate until you've raised at least Series B. I mean, you saw companies <laughs> where folks performed the safe, then another safe, then a first uh, um, uh, if numbered or figured seed stage round, and there was already secondary. <laughs> you've built nothing, you've sold nothing, and already you see the CEO with $5 million. That's a recipe for disaster. The same it is, is the case with Sirius A. That's too soon. I mean, what is Sirius A? Sirius A means that for the first time, the company has at least one sellable product and it has validated, validated the unit economics. That's it. Now we're beginning to grow. We're beginning to maybe for the first time have a sales team, marketing team. You're going to sell secondaries of that. Hmm. Well, whoever bought it is an idiot. <laughs> Pardon my French. Hmm. Now, yes, maybe you're really, really excited about the prospect of the company and you say, okay, this is a great opportunity for me to buy. But if you're the investor, you should be very, very adamant that nobody sells anything, at least until Sirius B. I got to tell you, when I was back at Gemini, we would have proved that when we would consider the founders who have earned that for five years on the road. Yes, you want to give them that liquidity. It's very tough on the home front to be a startup founder. There's a lot of sense in allowing some folks, the founders mostly, because they're the one that put the most on the line, to sell some secondary, get that length of brand, because the road should be a very long one. I don't recall a situation ever uh, prior to the craze of 2019 and on that we've ever allowed anything of that sort to happen before Series B, the, the earliest. Hmm. So that is sort of like the prudent approach that I would uh, advise. Yes, it's legitimate, but have them earn it. Because if you don't, one, you're incentivizing nothing. And you're not leaving enough incentive on the ground for the long winding road ahead. And it's horrible to be a startup CEO. It's horrible <laughs> to be a startup founder. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. <laughs> with the exception of those people who say, I have to do this or otherwise I won't sleep because this has to become a reality. I have to build this. Great. Go ahead. Do it. But I'm not going to tell you that it's going to be an easy road. And throughout 2019, 2021, until sometime in 22, folks were conveying the message, oh, it is easy. It should <laughs> be easy. Uh, raising money shouldn't be a problem. Yes, it should. One in a hundred should succeed. And very few afterwards, even if they succeed at raising money, should succeed at all. Most startups are supposed to fail. And half of investments more or less fail. And it just makes sense. There, there can't be that many innovators that are completely disrupting huge markets. It just statistically doesn't make any sense. Uh, so yeah, um, they need to earn it. They need to earn secondaries. And, and it's okay. Like I said, the people I appreciate and respect in VC are those that tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Uh, and I think that by itself is added value. The, the other side of this, this whole uh, secondary craze that happened is we've seen something very weird happening. 
And I think you would know this much, much, much better than I do. And and maybe you can t- tell me a little bit more about the technic- the technicalities of what yeah. I'm about to say, because the technicalities here are very important. And, and I don't want to say something that is not uh, factually correct. So what I saw is, and the notion of what I saw is that there were VCs who basically, they raised the fund, they started allocating that fund. And then on paper, w- while there was, obviously hype in the market they were already raising their second and third fund yeah. based on the first yeah. fund and ba- and not only that which i can understand how on paper you can leverage that but they were allocating funds from the second and third funds to the initial companies from the first fund okay. which in in essence if you put in if i if i took an alien if I if I an alien from Mars would land here and would look at this objectively, he would say two what words. He fuck? would say, "What the fuck?" He would say, "What the fuck?" And then he would say, "Pyramid scheme." You uh, know? Let's not use pyramid scheme, but let me I, I I let me break down what you said and why I agree. With you. First of all, secondaries for VCs that we mentioned before. Uh, that's only okay if you don't have any additional money to invest in additional follow-ons, then you should cash out. That, that's for that. As far as deflating the valuation, all a VC has until it reaches M&As, IPOs of the portfolio, is the IRR of the portfolio. The portfolio deflates in valuation. That's basically what you're supposed to do as a VC. You're supposed to bring companies to a milestone or help them reach the milestone that secures the next financing round, which hopefully is an up round, which you participate, but you can only preserve your holdings to a certain extent. Eventually you get diluted as you very well should, but hopefully you made the right choice that you'll have enough holdings at the event of secondary M&A IPO. For you to follow on invest in your fund one portfolio, with fund two money is just, it's it's a travesty. It's a complete no-no. I mean, if you're out of money, what you're supposed to be doing is say, okay, go back to the LPs that invested in the fund and say, look, we had that at Gemini. Fund five had nine companies that reached the growth stage out of 20, which was incredible. So, okay, we're going back to the, to the investors in the VC and we told them, there's so much opportunity and our companies are reaching series C, B, E, pre-IPO. Would you like you as the LPs to create an annex fund that's going to invest into our portfolio? Or the other case where you can do this, if you have the exact same bunch of LPs investing in the exact and same amount and same percentage, hmm. fund one and fund two, then it's okay. But otherwise, you're using rights that belong to fund one and you're allocating them to fund two, which are different LPs, different people. Hmm. That's not okay. Now, telling you that there aren't some funds that did it and that have been doing it for quite some time, yes, there have been. And I, I would doubt that LPs, the investors in the first fund that see that their rights, the rights that they have earned have been given to other investors uh, would look at that very positively. That's yeah. not something you should do. And yes, the the acceleration of, oh, we're, we've finished investing fund one in two years, three years, we're already raising. Yeah, you begin raising the next fund somewhere around year three, year four of the first uh, fund, but you don't deplete the money of fund one that quickly. Whenever you raise a fund, you need to allocate some of the money for follow-on investment. Usually, the amount of money you invest into a company and the follow-ons can almost equate and sometimes even exceed the Hmm. amount you invested in the first investment. It depends on the stage you invest in. Usually, seed investors would invest most in the beginning and then add a bit later in Series A, maybe Series B, but early stage, namely Series A, Series B, the follow-on amounts can sometimes even reach the same amount as the initial check. So you have to take into account, if I just gave a company $3 million, I'm actually putting aside $6 million. The free that I just put, another free that I might need to put in later. And 
a very prudent approach for that for, again, seasoned investors is to constant, constantly engage in what I call portfolio reviews. Every quarter, you sit down and you use very clear and very well-defined parameters to say, here is my top third in the portfolio that I should be bullish on. Here is the performing ones. And here are the underperformers, which unless they shape up, probably won't get additional cash because we, we can't be bullish over everyone. There's never enough money for follow-on investments to everyone. And it's one of the fucking worst conversations when you tell a startup CEO, we won't be backing you anymore. Uh, but that has to be KPI driven rather than inflating something on paper. Uh, so yeah, the, again, every, everything you've just described happens in hypes. It happens when there's too much money and money is cheap. And then everyone is beginning to say, what have we done? A lot of those funds will not be able to raise their next fund because hmm. the performance is what it is. And then they become ghost VCs. Absolutely. But by the way, one of the most interesting emergences of the dot-com bubble in 2001 was the emergence of uh, what the, the funds of funds in Israel. Vintage was started in 2001 as a vehicle that bought out portfolios, <laughs> funds that couldn't exist anymore, that couldn't raise fund two. A hell of a play there. Uh, by vintage. By, by vintage. And becoming a powerhouse as a result. They did the right time at the Rumble. And by the way, I think that now is the time for the emergence of the second vintage. <laughs> and, and by the way, as we speak, I actually know of a fund that is beginning to shape form that is going to buy out portfolios of funds that are not going to exist in a year or two, and rightfully so. Converge everything. By the way, if you look at the vintage, also show you a review every now and then of the evolution of Israeli uh, VCs, there's a hype and then there's a convergence. There are going to be less VCs in a while. And that's the way it's got to be. So whoever creates the next vintage and buys out some portfolios, yeah, they're going to buy a lot of crap, but they're also going to find some gems. In a, in a, in a, in a discounted price. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because they have to sell out everything simply to return ROI to their fund investors. And I, I, I kind of hope that folks that are in VC or will be in VC and listen to this, try and remember and sort of get signals when a hype begins to not play along. And as I'm saying it, I'm calling bullshit because I know it won't work and they will <laughs> play along. Uh, th there are always signs that something stupid is going on. Uh, the dot the the dot com bubble, uh, the mortgages for everyone, NFT. There's going to be something stupid in thirty one as well, more or less. When your barber starts talking to you about crypto, there you go. It's the time to talks sell about crypto. His crypto portfolio. Exactly. He talks about your his crypto portfolio and that he's that he decided to quit being a barber. Then you know something's going on. Like. Maybe keep your day job. Maybe <laughs> just one more year, and then let's not make rash decisions. Um, I have another. Uh, it's sure. it's, a, it's another technical question. I, I think you're the right person to answer this. So when okay, if he, you you manage a VC fund and it's not a VC firm and it's not it's not a sixteen Z yet, and it's not the reputation. I don't know, the fund maybe did, the, the firm did maybe two funds and they're still going on and still people are waiting to see what the ultimate IRR of that is. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, that fund goes in and starts and talks to LPs and talks to financial institutions. What do the, in, in, that, in that type of fund, what do the LPs look for in those conversations? Are the LPs, are, are the LPs very, uh, very intrigued in, in seeing what happens on paper with the recent funds of, of that VC firm, or are they more interested in seeing, okay, like it, right now, what's, what are, what are your specific, very specific plans with this specific potential fund? It's, it's a little bit of both. First of all, is what they're looking past viewership. You're still 
maybe too young to show a lot of M&As. But what you show on paper shows two things. One, that you were able to invest and get, you know, reasonable holdings in a company that is increasing in its value round by run. And also they would want to see who are the investors that followed on mm. after you invested. If they see NEA, if they see Lightspeed, if they see Sequoia, if they see uh, A16Z, okay, that's a good indication. Because at the end of the day, we do see VCs that are performers. I'm not talking about FOMO. I'm talking about earning the trust, or rather your portfolio, earning the trust of the best investors out there. When you see that, when you see that the best funds have followed on into your existing portfolio and the valuation is rising, okay, say it. These folks are giving us the right signal. As far as what you're doing in the current fund that you're raising, they want to understand and they want to see what you've learned from fund one, fund two. Um, they want to see that you're diligent, not just in the making the decision of the first check, but also in the follow-on checks. LPs that are seasoned and have been around really want to understand the follow-on Method methodology of the fund. And they do want to know if there's a certain area where you've already validated yourself as, okay, this is the fund. This is the go-to fund. Uh, this is one of the best cyber funds in Israel. This is the fund that's probably going to get the best cloud deals. Sort of what of a name have you created for yourself as an investor in certain fields? And how are you going to win? Because we're talking specifically about Israel. Israel is the second most rich, diverse VC startup ecosystem in the world after Silicon Valley, uh, more so than other uh, ecosystems within the US even. So they would definitely want to see how you intend to win deals, what it is that makes you uh, someone who is going to be a preferred choice for the best startups out there. And by fund three, you better have a really good answer <laughs> to that question. <laughs> Other than I'm a really nice guy, you know. Right. Uh, yeah, and I, know, and I have a network. Absolutely. Yeah. So how so, okay, so, so this is like, this is like a very gen, this is a, almost too general of a question, but I'm just intrigued. You met, I mean, man, you have access to this whole marketplace. You have the entrepreneurs who come to you. You have the fellow VCs. Yeah. You have the LPs and the institutionals and the people who make the decisions in this in this institutionals. You've been in, in a corporate VC. You've been in a, a in a private, you know, in a financial driven uh, VC. Um, so you've played like in this game for a while. Like how? If you had to, and this is a very general question again, but if you had to measure the sophistication level of the LP, of, of, of a usual LP compared to everyone else in that marketplace, where would that where would you rank that? And obviously there's like many different LPs, but if you really had to put kind of like positioned LP in that food chain, where would you do that? How would I rank specific LPs or what are the parameters like, I'm trying to sort of so like obviously there's a, I told you it's a tough question because it's a very general one and every yeah. LP is different right but right it's like look at this higher if you picture this as a hierarchy right where yeah. you have where you have the institutionals you have the LPs you have the VCs then you have the founders you have the CEO you have the you have right, uh, right. Well, as far as level of sophistication where would I put those yeah so the LPs, generally speaking, are basically saying we're not the founders and we are not those with the audacity to say that we will find the best founders. We mm -hmm. put that to you. Impress us. Mm -hmm. You're the one that is supposed to be sophisticated. You're the one that's supposed to have clear investment thesis around certain areas. You're the one, the VC that are, is supposed to say, oh, we're going to focus on these five topics. Okay, now explain why. Now explain why you would know anything about these topics. Why are these the topics that are worth investing in? Why are those the topics that are worth focusing in now? So they're expecting you 
to have that level of depth and expertise and even build around, you know, the advisory board and show that you have a track record in certain areas. They're not even trying to portray that they have that expertise. Very few LPs become direct investors into portfolio companies. Some do, but most don't. They're just saying, we're going to give you this bunch of money and you're going to keep us posted every quarter. And once a year, we're going to meet. And in eight to 10 years time, we want to see how much money you've made out of it. And if you've done good, or if you're giving us indications that you're doing good, we'll talk about your next fund hmm. around year five. But they're not trying to position themselves as very sophisticated and rightfully so. They're strictly financial and their measurement, the amount of KPIs that matter to them are very, very few. It's a yeah, very only one. Group. It's basically one. It's IRR and it's cash on cash. I mean, that, that's it. Those are the basically the two. Uh, so they don't have to be sophisticated. They don't have to claim to have added value. And it's sort of very honest, <laughs> a, a very honest chain within the chain value. They do develop over time a certain level of sophistication and proficiency in identifying potential stars in the investors and within portfolio companies that will reach the growth stage and they participate. And that also comes only out of ongoing measurement and ongoing learning and experience. Those that have invested, I think that the best ones among the LPs are those that have already been through at least one hype. Hmm. That have develop that thicker skin because they know that VC markets inflate once a decade. So they're no longer impressed with the uh, decade by decade lunacy that happens every eight to 10 years. They, they, they know it's coming. And most of them say, okay, we've, we've seen this before. Let's wait it out. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, they take the longest to recover because remember they have alternatives, usually LPs, family offices, institutionals, they have the entire range of investments that they can choose. It can be financial tools, it can be real estate, it can be infrastructure, it can be commodities. VC is just one bullet in their magazine. And at times they would say, we're not gonna allocate new money there because it's not been very fruitful recently. Um, and they're paying big checks, usually. <laughs> You've been super valuable with your time, but I have only two two questions. Please. So um, this question is I'm really interested on a personal level. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you are. I haven't really talked to you about this before, but do you invest in publicly traded companies in some sort of way in like a private way or like private way? Yeah, in a private I do, way. I do have my public portfolio that I invest my own money. I don't. Right. Uh, and I, I do not claim to have some unique Expert. knowledge or expertise to advise other people with theirs right. on that. So my question is this, did you, did it ever tickle you or did it ever intrigue you to get into the worlds of like hedge fund and, and, and the worlds of like publicly traded companies? Cause like you've been, I, I tell you why I'm asking this, like you've yeah. been in VC in a while and with VC, you have to be like super fucking patient, like for real, <laughs> like, and and you know and and like with the pub with public companies it's like you don't have it's like for the non-patient people right you can just like you can actually see tangible results uh, in the first day did that is this something that ever kind of like uh played a like two, two yeah. things be wary of that perception because at the mm. moment at the moment we are looking at we're looking at nvidia quadrupling in value with a 76 multiple on revenue, mind you. So this can be diffused any moment. Right. We That's the thing. With VC and with public markets, we tend to remember the huge events. What we forget and what we don't like to remember is the plateau. Hmm. Most of the time, it's a plateau, but we don't get to hear about that because nobody wants to write or discuss that nothing happened on Nasdaq. This yeah. Cisco, Cisco with the same price for 15 years. Cisco with the same price for 15 years. 
Uh, <laughs> Amazon yielding two and a half percent good week. <laughs> So let's not fool ourselves that this, what we're seeing now, by the way, at this moment in time, New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ are inflated. Right. They, we won't be able to support this for long. And also notice there's almost hardly any influx of new companies going into IPO because it's a horrible time to do so. Uh, but things will change. So I, I usually, in my personal public portfolio, I'm actually very patient. If I hold into a stock, I will hold it for years hmm. before I cash out. Uh, so that's one thing. Do I personally have that tickle of moving over to the hedge fund? I got to say for me, and this is just me, I really love the operational aspect of the mm. startup. I really enjoy the dilemmas. And that's why I enjoy, I've done all types of investments, seed early, late, but I really enjoyed the early stages. I enjoyed the C, I enjoyed the Series A because you get to be part of that process. Uh, I just told you one of the, our joint portfolio companies was formed <laughs> 10 feet in that direction in my backyard. I love it. I love being part of that. I enjoy it. I enjoy that rawness of, of the team and the story. So that's my personal uh, preference. And I, I have accumulated over 16 years some experience that can help them at those stages. So I would prefer to stick around for that. And you know what? That's what I think I'm good at. Uh, yeah. So I didn't, never had that uh, anxiousness and that FOMO about maybe I should try that sort of life. But I can definitely see why some people would be attracted to that. Absolutely. Okay, my last question for you. Um, favorite book that has kind of like impacted the way you think, the way you operate? I, I the, the one thing that I remember, I, I'm trying to remember what's the name of the book in English, but it's by Jack Welch, okay. uh, a former uh, CEO of, uh, of, uh, of General of Electric. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's called Lead, Lead and Win, um, but I, I will check myself. I will, I, will, I'll, I will check and then I will put in the show comments. Perfect. So here you have one guy who's got the experience and the battle proven tactics of a nation of MBA graduates <laughs> sharing his experience, his rises and, and downfalls in a very raw, I, I really suggest those who've never read anything by Jack Welch, start by looking at some interviews of his and panels that, on YouTube with Jack mm -hmm. Welch. You, he is it's completely binary it's zero or one you either love him or you hate him but you can't just say oh i'm, I'm not deterred or i'm not uh, affected that way or the other um and i've been really impacted by a lot of the things that he said and one of the things that he said that i really loved um was about career choices and he mm. said one thing that resonates mid with me and i think sort of guided me through my career and it was if you started a new job, new position, and on day one, you already know everything you need to, do, to know to succeed in that job, you chose the wrong job. Hmm. That makes so much sense. I mean, right. on, on, on one at face value would say, no, that means that you made a great choice. You're ready for the role that you're going to take. If you're not going to have to learn anything and improve and grow, then one, you as a person and your career is not improving and it's not growing, but also you're going to be bored out of your wits <laughs> if you're someone who aspires to succeed. So if you're not scared shitless on day one, you chose wrong. And, and I think that everyone who's honest was, who's made the right choice, was scared. And that does correlate to some CEOs and some VCs that tell you that you know, when nobody's looking, they have that imposter syndrome. Right. Today is the day that everyone's going to figure out. It's okay. It's okay <laughs> to have that. If you don't have that, you're not doing anything edgy. You're not taking any chances. You're not doing anything of, of value, of interest. So that's fine. And and Jack Welsh taught me that. So I, I think he's a great, he, in general, he, he wrote many books. That one sort of resonates with me. Amazing. Noam, thank you so much, man, for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, and, and looking forward to meet you and talk to you again. Absolutely. My pleasure. 
Awesome, man. Thank you. Take care.